and I'm really excited about it. And, and I really kind of wish we had more time to really dig into this because I really think there's something in this story about Simon the Sorcerer that a lot of people overlook, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty neat. Um, anyway, time for corny jokes with Rick Schoen. All right, Pastor Rick. So this lady, she takes her son to the doctor. He's a young boy. He's like eight years old or so. And she takes him to the doctor. She says, doctor, doctor, we've got a problem. And the doctor says, what is it? And she says, my son thinks he's a chicken. And he goes, what? She goes, he thinks he's a chicken. He's walking around like this all the time, going cluck, cluck, cluck. And he says, well, that sounds pretty serious. How long has he been doing it? And she says, about two years. And the doctor says, two years? What took you so long to bring him into me? And she said, well, we needed the eggs. I told you it's corny. That's what I do. All right. Now, although most of us would not aspire to be a chicken, although most of us would try to, to, to avoid anything that we would consider less than, many of us, we do strive to feel as if we're more than what we are. Often this is driven by insecurities. Insecurities make us build up some kind of a fake wall. It's called the impersonator. And the impersonator pops out there. And this is who the impersonator is. And we think that that is who we are. We try to find an identity with some kind of a status in society. But what this does is it creates an inward battle. It creates tension. And there's a battle inside of us that's going to happen. And that's what we're going to kind of focus on in today's message. Now, we've been going through the book of Acts, and some of the main themes in the book of Acts, uh, we've hit, and we're going to keep hitting these as we continue on. We're talking about the nature of the church, the purpose of the church, what the church does, what it's intended to do. We talked about the power of the church, the works of the Holy Spirit, working among the believers, the rapid growth of the church. In spite of persecution, it keeps on going. We even discussed the persecution of Stephen who was killed. He was stoned to death. In chapter 1, Jesus gives us the instructions. He gives the apostles the instructions to go, wait for the Holy Spirit, and they will be the witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In chapter, chapter 2, the whole day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down upon the church, and they begin living out their purpose. In chapter 3, um, we see that the apostles and the disciples are becoming verbal witnesses as, as, as testimonies to the people that Jesus is the Messiah, sharing the resurrection story, sharing the good news that God loves people, and that's the purpose be, uh, for why Jesus came to begin with. We see the miracles and the signs that accompany the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is quickly becoming the reputation of the church. These miracles, these signs, the preaching of the gospel, this is what the church is being known for. We also saw how the apostles began to uh, face persecution from the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And with Peter and John, they warned them not to speak about Jesus any longer, but they continued anyways because, quote, we must obey God rather than men. So we, we've talked about these things. Stephen facing the pressure from others who are enemies of the gospel, speaking the truth about God's plan, being revealed through Jesus Christ. Okay, we've seen all this. Then Saul, Saul, who is an influential leader amongst the Jews, he now enters the scene giving approval of those who killed Stephen. And in Acts chapter 8, at the very beginning, Saul affirms the persecution against the church. A persecution breaks out and forces believers to be scattered abroad. And Saul begins his mission of persecution. Let's start at Acts chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. We'll go through a few verses really quick and jump into the story of Simon the sorcerer. We'll pray first. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I thank you for allowing us to be here. And I pray for everyone who slept in today that they will still make it to second service. Because, Lord, there really is, in this text, there really is something very important for us to learn. And I pray, Lord, that we as a church would learn it. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Saul's bad theology. Um, I'm sorry, Simon's bad theology. 
Uh, verse 1 says, and Saul approved of their killing him, which everybody pretty much agrees should belong in chapter 7. Verse 2 says this, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. But those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now, up to this point, thousands of people had come to Christ. They had come to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. They were baptized, being, being, becoming a part or members of the church. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were added to the church that day. In Acts chapter 4, the number of men came to about 5,000. And that just says number of men. In Acts 5, uh, we also see that multitudes of men and women were believing in Jesus and were added to their number. In chapter 6, it begins by telling us that the disciples were increasing in number. So we see this theme of there is the gospel is moving, the gospel is spreading. We see that that rock referred to in Daniel has been growing into a mountain and it's going to continue to grow for millennia. The growth and the impact of the church was having uh, uh, in the world is one of the main themes of Acts. Written to Theophilus, this is an explanation of everything that's been going on in regards to Christian, Christianity, and uh, the church and Jesus, and the, uh, of Jesus Christ. Today, today we're going to see, instead of a general look on how people were coming to Christ, these groups of people were coming to Christ, we're going to start now reading into some more personal testimonies that's recorded by Luke, from which we can learn from. So far, the individual testimonies, um, coming, uh, people coming to the faith, they're pretty brief, they're pretty uh, general, or they're absent altogether. We don't know the stories of the people, we just know they're coming to know Jesus. Mostly, they're just a record of people believing. But in chapter 8, we're going to begin to see some personal stories, some personalities of people who are coming to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And in verse 4, when it says those who were scattered and went about preaching the word, okay, let's continue from there, and we'll pick it up in verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. By the way, remember, these are not the apostles. The apostles are still in Jerusalem. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. Now, remember, he's... Jesus had said, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. We already saw earlier in chapter 8 that they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, and we're seeing what Jesus had spoken of is coming to fruition. Verse 6, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, Impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So Philip goes to Samaria proclaiming Christ and performing many signs, healing, casting out unclean spirits, so much so that there was much rejoicing. Look at all the healing that's happening here. They're rejoicing because of it. Now, it's important to know that this is Philip, not the apostle Philip. This is Philip the evangelist. There's two Philips. Along with Stephen, Philip is one of the seven who was chosen to be a deacon in Acts chapter 6, one of the people who helped serve tables or bring administration to it. And we see here again, serving as a deacon doesn't keep one from being a witness to a lost world. Doing your job at church doesn't release us from doing the work of Christ in the world. Or not being a preacher, not being Greg Laurie, not being the evangelist Billy Graham, that's not me. That's really not happening in the Bible. Everyone is sharing about Jesus, including Philip, who was brought on to be a deacon in the church. And now we're going to introduce a new person to the storyline, and that's Simon the sorcerer, we'll pick up in verse 9. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. 
So they're really lifting this guy up. And I'm thinking he likes it. Verse 11, they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 13, Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Simon the sorcerer. Sorcery in the scriptures is continually condemned by God. Repeatedly throughout scripture, exercising any kind of spiritual activity engaged with the occult, sorcery, witchcraft is strongly condemned. However, it was so common in the ancient world that it wasn't weird that someone came along doing tricks. It was common. While some in acts, uh, some acts and demonstrations um, of these people who would go from town to town, some of them there were illusions. You know, you consider that like jugglers back in the olden days would come to town and they would do sleight of hand type of illusion type of a magic. That was pretty common as we can understand how illusionists do that kind of stuff today. However, there were some that tapped into dark forces. Others were empowered by Satan in an attempt to try to discredit the power of God. Some people believe that Simon was just an illusionist doing tricks and going, wow, ooh, ah, look at what you're doing. However, because it uses the word sorcery in this text, we believe that he probably really was someone who was trying to rob from God. And he was using whatever necessary for him to gain that. He was called the great power of God. So therefore, it seems to me that Simon was a puppet for the enemy of God. However, he didn't even realize probably he was being a puppet. Regardless of what Simon was doing, Philip was bringing the real deal. Regardless of all the illusions or the sorcery that was happening, Philip was really demonstrating the power of God through his life. The power of God was moving among the believers and people's lives were being changed. Not because of the signs alone, however, but because of the message of Jesus Christ. Now, while the signs may have drawn the attention of the people, it's not signs alone that actually allows people to understand what Jesus is all about. It may be kind of like attracting the crowd in order to be able to speak truth into people's lives. It was a message that the apostles had preached. It was the message that they had been living out, and it was the message that now people were being won over with. You see, Simon proclaimed a message that glorified himself. I'm great. I'm wonderful. Look how fantastic I am. But Peter, he comes along and he does things differently. He's not seeking his own glory. In fact, the people throughout Samaria believe Simon was someone great. And then when P uh, Phil uh, Philip comes along, all of a sudden you have somebody w not wanting to be, be great doing incredible things. Now, you know the old saying, you may fool all people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time? I think that's what Simon was trying to do. I think he was just trying to fool people for his own personal ego. On the other hand, Philip proclaimed a message that glorified Jesus Christ. He declared the good news that the kingdom of God had come and everyone was welcome to join it. And so Simon, it seems, as if he joined it. Simon believes he was uh, uh, believed. Uh, he is baptized. Um, now, there's another old idiom, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, <laughs> right? Well, some people speculate that, that Simon was just doing this. He was just joining the church, being baptized, going along, you know, jumping through the hoops so he can follow Philip along to find out more about this amazing power that he has. He was a bad guy through and through. And so all he wanted to do for his own glory was follow this guy and find out the secrets to the tricks that Philip had. Leaving behind the old self and truly becoming born again requires more than just following a crown. Becoming born again and finding new life in Jesus Christ requires more than just attaching ourselves to something that is a popular spiritual figurehead. We were told, we are told that Simon, even though he was a trickster or a magician, 
it says he believed Philip's message and he was baptized. Since it says he believed, I tend to believe that he did, in fact, come to Christ. Although some commentaries will disagree with me. I believe he was walking away from his past. I believe he was seeking to begin a new life in Christ. But as such was Simon, how many people are there that come from dark places to follow Christ? They choose to believe that the Bible teaches that God is not far from us, and, and they grab a hold of that. But then something from the old life begins to come back up. It seems to me, whatever part of the flesh it was that motivated Simon towards the magic arts to begin with, it seems to me he either never really surrendered it or it was beginning to tempt him. It was beginning to creep back into his life and tempt him. That's how I read this story. Let's continue on, verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Now remember, the apostles are the apostles are still in Jerusalem. Philip, the guy who was brought on with Stephen to, to wait, wait to serve the, the widows, they end up, he ends up in Samaria. He ends up, they're accepting the gospel. People are coming to know Jesus Christ. So they send word back to Jerusalem to Peter and John and the other apostles, the 12, and now they're going to say, okay, let's go down to Samaria so we can go see for ourselves what God is doing here. Verse 15, when they arrived, Peter and John, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter, verse 17, then Peter and John, placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, and he said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I, I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Ah, the old Simon is revealed. Assuming there is a new Simon... The old Simon is beginning to creep back. The old Simon that wanted to be great, to be called great, to impress people, that Simon isn't completely dead. He sees something that impresses others. He sees something, and since being a somebody matters more to him than being in God's will, this part of him is revealed. Instead of sitting back and just being in, in amazement, of what God is doing and, and just deciding I'm going to do what God wants me to do, he sees that and he says, I want that. Question, is the flesh of our past really dead when we confess Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior? That's a legitimate question considering the text that we're in. Have we really made the decision to leave the flesh behind? Or do we find ourselves still pursuing our own glory for, our, uh, for the sake of our own kingdom? Do we really find ourselves looking at the inner desires of our heart and saying, God, kill them so that I can be 100% wholly yours? Or do we continue to say, I still kind of want to hold on to this because it makes me feel good? Position, power, money applause, whatever it may be. If that's not what God wants for us, we have to be willing to let that die with it. As in the case with Simon here, the truth will eventually be known. And I think every thinking Christian has to examine their hearts and say, God, is this pure coming out of me? Now, I got I to gotta speak into this quickly because uh, for a few months, I found myself getting really agitated and really angry. I found myself in my kitchen when something like cabinet doors were being left open. <laughs> yeah, see? Uh-huh, right? And I find myself being enraged. I'm in the car, and this wrath wants to come out. And my wife's saying, honey, it's not a big deal. It's just cabinet. As long as we have six kids, there's going to be six times as many problems around the house 
than normal families are going to have. But I knew the problem wasn't that the cabinet doors. The problem's not the traffic. The problem's not the two people going slow in the left-hand turn lane that it starts turning yellow, which you totally could have made it by green, and then you end up going through that red light. No, I'm talking about what happened to me this week. Here's the thing. I knew a few months back that when I was enraged, I had told my wife, I said, the problem's not the cabinets, honey. The problem's my heart. The problem's my heart. There's something in the old Rick that is welling up that wants to fight. There's something in the old me that's welling up that wants to justify, that wants to, to whatever it is. See, we may not look at Simon the Sorcerer and go, oh, yeah, I would totally learn how to do sorcery and get famous and rich and have people go, wow, you're so great. I, that's not my temperament, but I do have a temperament, and there's still a flesh there. The question is, has that been completely extinguished? That's a question for us. Has that been completely extinguished? So what happens? He comes up to Peter and he says, this is an incredible thing you guys are doing. This is wonderful. It's great. I want to help too. Here's some money. Give me that same gift. Assuming he wanted to help. Assuming he was trying to mask his own self-glory, his own ego, to try to make it look Christianized. He said, I want this. Here's some money. Let's make a deal. Verse 20. Peter answered, may your money perish with you. You know what, you guys? If I spoke to anyone in the church this harshly, they'd be gone. <laughs> You're right? If someone come and came and did, did something that was out, outright just a sin, and I said, may your attitude perish with you, you would be like, You're crazy, and you'd be gone. Like, you know, how dare you? Maybe you would think that way. But this is Peter. This is one of the 12 that walked with Jesus. This is someone who was given authority over the church. This is someone who has the authority given in him, the Holy Spirit working through his life in a way that when he's rebuking you, there really is no justification. There really is, it might as well be God himself rebuking him. He says, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. His heart wasn't right. His heart wasn't right. He thought that the Lord works as men do. Or he thought the people of the Lord work as regular people do. Because if we want something in this world, we assume it's attainable. If we want something in this world, we could make the money to buy it or we can bribe somebody. We can make a deal. There's always something to trade to get what we want. In this world, any commodity you may desire can be attained one way or another. But not so with God. He is not bargained with. You don't make a deal with God. He offers, we choose to accept or not. Salvation can't be purchased by good works, money. Only the blood of, blood of Christ has the ability to do that. And the Holy Spirit can't be purchased either. We either surrender and take whatever portion God chooses for us in his kingdom, or we keep wheeling and dealing through life for our own kingdom's sake. For there is no middle ground. Simon seems to want to make a deal. You know, I've heard people say in my life two or three times, people have said, you know, I made a deal with God. Hey, brother, you know, you say you believe in Jesus and you don't come to church and this is your lifestyle and you know that, don't worry about me, Rick, me and God have a deal. And I want to go, really? Because God don't deal. God portions to each person what he chooses to portion not what man wants or desires or chooses. He knows all things, and his plan is bigger and better than any of our plans. Amen. This testimony of a struggling disciple is kind of how I see it. It teaches us that this is not how to approach God. So how does Simon respond to Peter's rebuke? 
how does Simon, I mean, you got to think that, 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 that Peter is, it, think about this for a second. Peter's the one that's going to deny Jesus three times. And Jesus says, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And so right after that, Jesus tells Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed that when you return, that you may grow in your faith, essentially, is what he's saying. Right after Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times, he says, Satan is behind this. He's going to try to sift you like wheat. I'm praying your faith won't fail, but when you return, because he is going to fail, just know that you need to continue walking and trusting in, in faith in me. So Peter understands what it means to let the flesh take over. Peter understands these things. And so what's his heart going to be? When Simon demonstrates apparently a change of heart, pick it up in verse 22. Peter says, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. So Peter tells him, this is the solution to your problem. Verse 23, for I see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin. By the way, I, I, I didn't include that in the first part I should have. Peter sees clearly what, is, what it is that motivates Simon. God gives him the ability to see something. He's bitter, and he has a dispensation towards sin. Essentially, sin is selfishness. You know, it really boils down to that. When we're thinking of ourselves, when we're thinking of our own kingdoms, when we're thinking about our own profit, when we're thinking about our own stake in the game, when we're thinking about what this is going to make me look like, Ultimately, we're concerned about our own struggles, I mean, our own kingdom, and we're hoping to, to be something more than what we really are, rather than living something bigger than ourselves. The gospel is bigger than our little kingdoms. The church is bigger than our little kingdoms. The gospel is what saves people from eternal separation from God. The gospel, through the Holy Spirit, teaches us to say no to ourselves and yes to God. The gospel teaches us to say no to the flesh and yes to the Spirit. This is what the church is supposed to look like. If Peter allows Simon in, if anyone in the church allows Simon in with their ulterior motives... It messes up the purity and the purpose of God's kingdom. The gospel gives us wisdom and insight to God's plan for this world. And it, it frees us from the bondage of sin. In this case, the bondage of sin that Simon was controlled by was revealed through his desire to be someone great. But as Jesus taught, whoever wishes to be first must be last. And whoever wishes to be great must become least. I think Simon the sorcerer missed out on those teachings. The kingdom of God is not like the kingdoms of this earth. Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 20 what the kingdoms of the earth look like and what the kingdom of God looks like. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And that means lord their authority over others. And then their high officials exercise authority over them. So in other words, here's this hierarchy. They're in control, but then they have a boss. And they're in power, but then they have a boss, right? He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, side note, and I probably won't do this second hour. I might. When you look at politics and socialism, socialism has an elite people who rule over. Traditional American government says, no, the people rule and elect the representative who is speak to be a servant. And when it comes to politics, we need to be careful and looking at what's going on, what kind of structures are happening in our society, because it's a more biblical model, the American government system. I'm not saying it's perfect or not without flaw, but we need to be careful because the socialism thing is really rising up, and ultimately it, it comes down to you have a higher class that rules over the lower class, and that is not how I believe Jesus 
would want us to be. Anyways, off my tangent, let's keep going. Real power comes, real power comes in our personal lives, real power comes in our church lives, real power comes overall. This is just a truth of God. Real power comes when we trust in God with whatever portion he has for us. For us to trust that he only has us here, well, God must have people placed there because I'm not there, and that's okay. This place of prominence, this place of glory, this place of recognition, this place of fame, this place of whatever it is that you want or desire, affirmation. If we're seeking that, if we could truly learn to die to ourselves and say, God, I am happy with the portion you have for me, and I trust you'll take care of those other positions that need to be filled, there's joy in that. Trusting God with whatever portion he has for us matters. It really matters, not just in the big picture and how the community, the church functions, but it matters with the health and the peace within our own lives. Let's continue. Acts chapter 8, verse 24 to 25. Then Simon answered. This is his response to the rebuke. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. It seems as if he's humbled. It seems as if he's contrite. It seems as if he's like, I didn't realize what I was doing. And what does he do? He confesses. Verse 25. And after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So they continue on preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. There's two things that I really want to focus in here on this message. Two main points. One, the gospel is being spread to the people of the church, not the apostles alone. The church is growing through the work of the people of the church, not the leaders of the church. It's very important that we understand that just as Jesus said that the gospel would be preached in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, this is what's happening, and it's happening from the common folk. And the job isn't left to the apostles alone. So the question is, what share in the gospel does God have for you? Is the expectation, Rick, you need to come to my work and share with people? Is the expectation, hey, Elder Tom, Elder Mark, Elder Tony, would you please come and share the gospel with this person? Or should each Christian understand what the gospel is in a way to be as the first century church was? That was one, my first observation. But the second is this. Full surrender is needed for God to move in our lives. Full surrender, holding back portions, not an option. Full surrender is needed for God to move in our lives. If we try to use the Spirit for our own glory, there will be conflict and we will lose. The Holy Spirit isn't for us to attain and control as if he's just a force or a power. This isn't Star Wars. The Holy Spirit is God. It's one of the persons of God. Therefore, let us not leave this place without understanding that the Spirit isn't a commodity that we can command, but a person who's to command us. And when the Holy Spirit's speaking to us to sit down, when the Holy Spirit's saying, put that, uh, re, uh, kill that off, kill that flesh, when the Spirit says, don't speak, <laughs> when the Spirit says, speak, instead of us trying to use things of the church, attributes of the church, or attributes of God for our own glorification, we really need to recognize the dangerous road we're walking down. True power requires true surrender to God because it's not ours. And, by the way, surrender isn't a one-time thing. <laughs> surrender is not a one-time thing. I gave my life to Jesus. I walked down and got baptized and I'm good. Surrender is a perpetual state of mind and spirit. Our hearts, our souls, our minds need to be living out surrender on a daily basis. Surrender is not only the right frame of mind for every believer, it's the only frame of mind 
for every believer. That's what the Beatitudes are all about. If you guys remember when Jesus was preaching his long message in Matthew chapter 5, he begins by talking about these Beatitudes. Jesus teaches us the right way, the only way, to to have peace and success in this world with God. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through, 3 through 10, you probably are familiar with these. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Did Simon the sorcerer have a poor spirit? Was he humble and meek? Or was he seeking his own glorification? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be fulfilled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, this story about Simon the sorcerer to me has less to do with this evil, wicked man who was a cancer on the church. To me, it's more of a story that more people who would be willing to admit can connect to. Why do I go to this church? It makes me feel good. Why do I belong to this group? Because they like me there. Why do I do X, Y, and Z? Because there I have a place of high standing. I'm a big fish in a small pond. I like that. And I gotta be honest with you. A lot of people, if we were to be talking about this candidly, I think a lot of people, if they were honest, would recognize, yeah, that's kind of me too. I'm always seeking my own glory. I'm seeking my own benefit. I'm seeking my own blessings. I'm seeking my own kingdom. And I think the attitude that Simon had where he was willing to repent, apparently, would be the right attitude to have on a daily basis. When we see the flesh creeping in, when we see the flesh creeping up, can we even have the humility to accept a rebuke from someone? And if we do hear the rebuke, may we have the kind of heart that would just say, I am sorry, you're right. God, kill this part of me. Help me to surrender with my whole life. May we desire to be with Jesus and follow his will for our lives and be okay with it. May we put to death any spirit of bartering with God and trust that God has so many blessings waiting for us in the wings that even if for now we don't see any of those blessings, we're okay with it. And are we committed to sharing the love of God with people who don't know it yet? I mean, it really comes down to what is God's motive here. God is motivated by love. And he wants people to be back in a relationship with him. And it can't happen through payments, through money, through position, through glory, through fame. It only happens through surrender. And then I got to think about this. We're going to go ahead and go into the communion time right now. So if the ushers want to get ready. What a perfect picture the cross is of surrender. Jesus, God in the flesh, surrendered to man to let them do to his body what they wanted to do to his body. He surrendered himself. He could have called down legion of angels to defend him. He could have said, ah, that's enough. I'm done. Come down off of the cross and just kill everybody off right there. He was motivated by love to stay there. Surrender because you love someone. Surrender because you love God matters. And the picture where Jesus was at the table with his disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. When he held up the cup, he said, this is my blood which is poured out for you. Take and drink. When we see that picture, when we see ourselves sitting at that table, 
The concept of surrender is synonymous with the very actions that Jesus was going to take on the cross just a few hours later. And so right now, as the trays are going to go by, there's two trays. The bread is on the bottom, or there's two cups. The bread is in the bottom cup. Juice is in the top cup. Take, take, take a couple of minutes with the Lord. Ask the Spirit to examine your heart to see if there's anything in the flesh that you really need to give up. And see if God can take you to that deeper place of surrender with Him. Let's pray. Father, we ask that today Your hand, Your will, Your Spirit would run our lives. We pray, Lord, that what we see in this world isn't all there is. Lord, may we have hearts that trust you, that surrender, and that is satisfied with the portion you have for us. Father, we come to you today through the blood of Jesus Christ, who surrendered himself to men to suffer and to die. And I pray, Lord, that same temperament of surrender would be ours. Lord, that we're willing to put the other guy first. That we're willing to talk up the other person more. Lord, I pray that we would be motivated by love the way you were before you went to the cross. So right now as we share together in the community, I pray, Lord Jesus, that more than ever we find ourselves united, humble, and willing to surrender to your will. In Jesus' name we pray.